There is a word from the Lord this afternoon, if you will. Come with us to the Old Testament, the, the book of the Exodus, chapter 2, and we want to lift up verse 25 as our uh, central point of reference, however, to get the larger, immediate, larger understanding and in context, <clears throat> verse 23, 24, and 25 will probably be a little bit more uh, appropriate for us to review. Amen. And it's fine, TT, if you don't go back to 23. I know I didn't give that to you, but I'm going to go back to verse number 23 and come to verse number 25. Uh, from the ESV. I'm just going to read from the ESV uh, the context. It says, During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Verse number 25 in the ESV says, God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. And God saw the people of Israel, and God knew new. The King James Version, verse number 25 says, and God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. The ESV again, God, the ESV verse 25 says, God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. The New American Standard Bible, NASPY, says God saw the sons of Israel and God took notice of them. And the NIV, the New International Version of the Bible, says so God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. In Peterson's, Eugene Peterson's Message Bible, the Message Bible, a paraphrased Bible, verse number 25 says, God saw what was going on with Israel. God understood. Brothers and sisters, friends and family, just for a few moments, a few minutes this afternoon, I want to let you know and to remind you very simply and very clearly that God sees and God knows. God sees and God, he knows. We're living in a time that we are reminded that although dealing with this pandemic, worldwide, that's why we call it a pandemic, because everyone is affected. Worldwide pandemic is somewhat redundant, but the point is it's widespread and it has invaded, it has saturated every, every part of our, our lives and our beings from our homes to our jobs, to our schools, including graduations, to our worship activities, <clears throat> to our casual interactions, to our would-be and wish-could-be life excursions and vacations and getaways. Because of this, our world has kind of been turned upside down. Yet, in the midst of this 
seemingly high-ranking problem and issue that the world is facing, we're reminded that we still have to deal with injustice. We still have to deal with racism. We still have to deal with hatred. We still have to do, deal with wickedness and unrighteousness in our lives. Just because we're dealing with this coronavirus and COVID-19 pandemic didn't mean that all of the other stuff stopped and was put on hold and was put on the sideline because there's a central focus on this particular major issue. As a matter of fact, I said major issue, but it did not, and it does not diminish the gravity and the magnitude of the injustice and the hatred and the racism and the wickedness and the unrighteousness. Just about seven days ago, I'm sure you already know, a young man by the name of George Floyd, Minnesota, a black man, was pinned down, handcuffed by a white police officer who proceeded to hold his knee to this handcuffed black man to his neck as Mr. Floyd, Brother Floyd, repeatedly and profoundly proclaimed, I can't breathe. Yet, there was no release, there was no letting up, there was no backing off, and he was already detained. Despite what happened prior to that, the situation was under control, yet he died because he could not breathe because the police officer's knee was on his neck and even in the, his last efforts of begging, just, you don't have to let me up, just let me breathe, he was denied. But brothers and sisters, we know that situations occur. We know that things happen, but what's particularly frustrating and angering and Disappointing for us is that this is not the first time and it most likely won't be the last time that we have these conversations, that we see this happening. One, one person said, I don't remember who, to, who I'm citing or who to give credit to, but it's a truth and, and, and perhaps they didn't come up with it, but somebody said, Racism just didn't just start up again. It's it's just now being recorded. It's being it's being it's being captured. This this type of response happens day in and day out. But not very long ago, a young man in in Georgia, Ahmad Arbery, we heard a similar resolve to his situation. It didn't involve a police officer, but it involved two white men, this black man, Mr. Arbery, who was out for a run or a jog or whatever he was doing, and because they wanted to make a citizen's arrest, they felt it was their civic duty 
to apprehend, and I don't know what their aim was, what their objective was, but we know that it ended in him being shot to death by these two men, father and the son. And the sad thing, the even further stressful and frustrating thing is that we think back just a little ways in, in names like Brianna Taylor and Sandra Bland and Philando Castile and Eric Garner and Trayvon Martin. Because there's a cycle, because this keeps happening over and over and over again, we find ourselves, and I know some of you are saying, well, are you going to talk about the text? You know I'm not a preacher that is going to just talk about current events and not preach the word of God. So what we find, well, we find ourselves, brothers and sisters, whether you want to believe it or admit it or not, or others want to believe or admit it or not, we are just like the children of Israel. We are in a state of oppression. And here's the problem and our premise that is derived from this text. I lifted up chapter 2 and verses 23 through 25, but you really got to go back to uh, chapter 1 and bring it all the way up there to get the entire and the full picture. But the fact of the matter is, here's our problem, the problem and our premise is that there is, watch this, a targeted, that means it's directed, it's not, it's not, it's not, is not just thrown in the wind. It's not just let it fall where it may, but it is a targeted, a specific ongoing, meaning that it is not something that is a rare occurrence, but it's something that happens continuously and regularly enough to be classified as ongoing, systemic, systemic and systematic, systemic meaning that it has invaded and pervaded and, and engulfed the entire system, meaning our culture is, in, is, 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 is invaded and is saturated by this problem and this, <laughs> this, this local pandemic that we've been dealing with as people of ebony hue, as people of color in this particular country, a targeted, ongoing, systemic, meaning it affects, it's, it's in the entire system, but also systematic, which means it's not, it's organized. It's, and, and I know that you may say, well, this ain't organized. No, this is, it's, it's, it's embedded in our work, and it has to be because it grew out of the foundations of our country, which was built on the back of slaves. It is something that whether, whether individuals realize it or not, they're brought into a mindset that <clears throat> perpetuates this problem that we see here. So then it is systemic and <clears throat> it is systematic oppression. Let me tell you, <clears throat> oppression not exist except the oppressor is the one with the power and with the authority and subdues the oppressed. See, if De when, Debo, when Debo comes on your street and, and takes your chain and takes your bicycle, he has, the, he has the, the power in that situation and he oppresses, uh huh, he oppresses the ones who who are under that, that pressure. Smoking them, y'all know. And so there's a targeted, ongoing, systemic and systematic oppression of a particular group of people. It's a particular group of people because it doesn't impact every group of people. As a matter of fact, there's a difference in, 
and the response and these same illustrations that we gave, if they were played out, if these individuals, these black men and black women, if their, the color of their skin were different in those situations, the outcomes would have likely been different. There's no question about it. This is not debatable. This is facts, as, as our young people say these days, facts. And the problem, here's, here's, here's what's, what's the main issue for us. There appears to be no end of this in sight. That's, that is where the depth of the problem lies. <clears throat> there are the targeted, ongoing, systemic, and systematic oppression of a particular group of people, and there appears to be no end in sight. That is what the children of Israel were facing. If you think about it, while they were in bondage in Egypt, 400 years, I mean, that's a long time to wake up every morning <clears throat> And even though it seems like things got better yesterday, your oppressor reminded you ain't nothing changed. I know I said that grammatically incorrect, but nothing has changed. Seems like you take one step forward, but the oppressor is going to demonstrate that no, no, don't get too uppity because you're, you're, not, you're not there. As a matter of fact, you're not there, meaning you're not here. And I know, and trust me, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of painting this with a broad uh, brush stroke. I know that not everybody, not every white person, not every black person is guilty of, 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 of the things that we've seen, but it's widespread enough that somebody ought to be paying attention. Somebody ought to sit up and say that there has to be a change. But just like the children of Israel, when you, when you see this is going on and on every time you, it seems like you, you, you're able to take a breath, no pun intended, you see the same thing happening again and you don't want to become callous and numb to it every time. As a matter of fact, I could tell you right now, it's a redundancy. I remember when I first came back to Deerfield, to Florida, to pastor, and there were some things that were happening in our nation, and we met at the Cathedral Church of God, and it was a, a, ta a community town hall meeting. We had the uh, city officials, had the uh, sheriff's office there, had the, the, the clergy was there, the people were there. I remember the conversation very well, but then during this, just a few months ago, we had another meeting because of some more recent incidents, particularly here in the city of Deerfield. And I got to tell you, if I didn't know any better, I would think that I was at the same meeting because we were saying the same thing that we said two years ago, three years ago. We were, we were making the same gripes that we made two, three years ago. We came up with the same solutions that we came up with two or three years ago. We got the same responses that we got two or three years ago. And when you see that this thing is happening over and over and you're not really making any progress, this elicits, it incites, it produces, it stirs up feelings of anger and anxiety, of fear and frustration, of hopelessness and helplessness, and if you're not careful, maybe even some hatred, but we don't want y'all to go there, but the fee these feelings have a tendency to motivate uh, violence and vengeance, riot and revolution, and so is there an answer for us? Well, here's the thing, brothers and sisters. We learned this, our ancestors learned this a long time, and they learned, learned this during the times of slavery and, and post-slavery and civil rights and Jim Crow and segregation and, 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 and not uh, separate but not equal. The whole, all that, all of that, those periods of time, brothers and sisters, they've learned and we have to remind ourselves what the proposition to our problem and our premise, and you may not want to hear this, you may, this may not be enough for you, and that doesn't mean that we don't have work to do, but if we're going to maintain our sanity, we've got to remember and know that God sees 
and God knows our oppression. He understands and he cares about what we are going through. God sees and God knows what his people are dealing with. And God cares about what we are going through. Like I said, that may not be enough for all of us, but that in itself should really be enough in terms of our perspective, those of us that are in Christ, those who, of us who are children of God, to understand and to know that we have work to do. God gives us a responsibility and a response, but it's not up to us. It's up to God. And if we keep on walking, if we keep on talking, we keep on speaking truth to power, we keep on standing up, we keep on sitting down when we need to sit down, we keep on sitting in when we need to sit in, we we keep lifting up our voices and letting the world know that we will not accept Accept this, but the bottom line is God is the one that has to break the yoke. God is the one that has to deliver from the oppression. Because otherwise, we go we we'll go crazy. How do you how do you deal with well? I'm glad you asked because it's it's here in the text, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> if I can just jump back to Chapter 1 and verse 8 and 9, real quick, and I see my clock right there. I know, I know Bethlehem, y'all don't mind if I take my time, but I want to make sure you're not letting your, what's in your crock pot, I don't want it to, to overcook. Verse number 8 and 9 in ESV, Exodus chapter 1 says, Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph, and he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. There was a new king, that a new pharaoh, that took the throne in Egypt, and the Bible says, Moses, the writer here, proclaims that this new king did not know Joseph. Joseph. You know Joseph, the son of Jacob, the son of Israel, who was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the children of Israel. This king did not know Joseph, and therefore he was fearful and said to his people, to his, to his countrymen, he said, listen, we know that these people are here in the land with us, and it's a lot of them. They've been multiplying. There are too many, and they are too mighty for us. He said, if our enemies wage war against us, perhaps they'll take their side because we've been treating them poorly, and they will rise up against us. But here's the principle, brothers and sisters, that's brought out in verse number 8 and 9. God sees and God knows the willful ignorance and wanton insecurity of the oppressor. I need y'all to just let me, let me explain and unpackage that for a moment. God sees and God knows the willful ignorance. I want y'all to understand and, 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 and hear that the difference between uh, ignorance or, or, or on, the, on, on two sides of the same coin or two ends of the same spectrum is ignorance and intimacy. It simply means, ignorance, ignorance simply means that you don't know and intimacy means you have a deep knowledge of. We, intimacy is not just about 
physical uh, interaction and touch. What it really means is that I know you. You know me in a way that's deeper than just surface. That's why nobody should know you better than your spouse because when you go into your secret room, your bedroom, there's something that you share between each other. There's an intimacy. There's a knowledge. In other words, my, my wife should be able to see some birthmarks and some scars. She knows me intimate, more intimately than anybody else should. Y'all feeling me? Y'all hear me? So when there, is, when there is a deep knowledge, there is an intimacy, but when there is no knowledge, when there is a, a, a lack of knowledge, there is ignorance, and there is the willful ignorance of the oppressor because he said, the Bible says that this new king did not know Joseph. How do you not know Joseph? Joseph was the one who saved the world from famine. Joseph was the one that was only second to the king, to the pharaohs. Joseph was the one, by God's provision, helped the king to store up during the time of the famine so that everybody from all over the world come to Egypt when they needed food. Joseph was the one. How do you not know the country? of those that you are oppressing? How do you not know what our culture has given to this? How do you not know what our, the, the backs of our ancestors has built in this country? Because you don't want to know. You just, it's willful ignorance and not really, not really, really ignorance, but just not an acknowledgement that you need me just as much as I need you. But God sees the willful ignorance and, and the wanton insecurity of the oppressor. In verse number nine, he says to his people, he says, there is too many of them and they're too mighty for us. Wanton means unprovoked. You really don't have a, you, your fear. There's an insecurity. There's a fear that's not warranted. There's a fear that, that came out of and that was birthed out of, not of an act against you, but watch this. Really, it comes out of a guilt about the way you treated them so you're afraid because they've grown in number that they're going to retaliate, but it's a wanton insecurity because they never lifted a finger against you. That's what I'm talking about, the children of Israel. They never rose. You know why? Because they were living the good life. Jo the descendants of Joseph, the children of Israel, were living in Egypt because their forefathers saved the world, saved Egypt from utter destruction, and as a reward, as a consequence to that that, that, that heroic action, the children of Israel was living in the same land, but the, the Egyptians didn't like. There was still a hatred. There was still a division. There was still a deep-running animosity toward them, and therefore there was a wanton insecurity because I don't like you, therefore I'm afraid of you. I don't like you, therefore I feel like I've got to get you before you get me. I'm afraid of you, therefore I've got to pull my, my arm, my, 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 my gun and shoot you and make sure that you are disabled even reaching for anything, even though it was just your cell phone in your hand, even though your hands were up, even though you were trying to, you were begging to breathe, but because you are a threat, it's a wanton insecurity. But I know not everybody is ready for this. I know, but, but this, this is, this is the, in the text today. And here's the thing, brothers and sisters. I said, there's, there, there's an ignorance there. And this reminds me, and, and, and it's not always, I, I must admit, it's not always obvious. It's not always, I, I, look, I have, I know this, this is, all, always the wrong thing to say, but you know, I'm, I'm free. And I, I, there's a lot of white people that I'm, I'm real close with. That I love, oh, I love all of them, but there are, there are some that I know, I know walk in righteousness, right? There's no question about it. So not everybody, not everybody is, is guilty. And, and there, there, look, there are some of us 
that, 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 that are just as hateful, just as wrong, just as destructive as they are. So this, 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 it, there's enough to go around to everybody, but, but this is something specific. And I know that the ignorance is not always obvious to them. I believe that, I honestly believe that not, not everyone, but because it's systemic and systematic, sometimes you, you, you find your, yourself in it and you don't even realize it. I was speaking to a, 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 a young woman, a white woman, <clears throat> um, right during the time that we had our last uh, Worship Without Walls um, evangelistic tent revival uh, event. And I met her, and I had a, a long conversation with her because, and, and I believe her to be a true follower of the way, a believer, a Christian, if you will. And we were in, a, in the course of our, during the course of our conversation, we were talking about a whole lot of different things. But the, 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 the conversation, in the, in the midst of the conversation, we brought up the concept of white privilege. And she proudly um, shared with me, she said someone you know, accused her of having white privilege, and, and we're talking about a, a, a Caucasian, um, bl literally blonde hair, blue eyed lady, and she said, I don't, under, I don't understand how could I have white privilege when, I mean, I grew up, I didn't have a whole, we didn't have a whole lot of money. We didn't have a whole lot of resources. My, my dad, you know, my parents, they weren't, they weren't, you know, wealthy. I didn't grow up with a silver spoon in my mouth. She, she told me about her story and her upbringing and, and she lived in different countries and things like that. Um, but, and, and, and it was a modest upbringing and I had to share with her. I said, I, I said, it's, it, it's not about what you had. It's the fact that by the mere complexion and the color of your skin, you automatically get the benefit of the doubt. That, that's what white privilege is, that even before you open your mouth, you're already in the plus column just because of how you look. By definition, you have inherent advantages that's possessed by you simply because of the color of your skin and based on your race because you're, we're in a society that's characterized by racial classification and inequality and injustice. That's just the reality. I mean, if anybody is arguing that point, then we can't, we can't even have a conversation because if you're denying that it exists, then you, you I mean, just turn on the news, just look at the, the news, then, then you're in denial. But the white privilege, it's not about what your mindset is. The white privilege is the fact that you can enter a store and it's assumed that you have the means to pay for any merchant, merchandise, but not only that you have the means, but that you will pay for it. When I walk into a store, I'm going to be clocked by the security. I know y'all don't want to hear this, but it's the reality. It means that when you go in for a job interview, it is assumed that you possess the basic qualifications for the job. I know that I have to work twice as hard. I've got to speak twice as well. i got to make sure I conjugate my verbs correctly. i got to make sure that my nouns and my, my pronouns and my verbs agree, that my, 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 my subject and my, my predicate, that it agrees I'm going to have to make sure that I say the right thing, that I look the right part. When I go into a job interview, when you go to get pulled for a traffic violation, it is assumed that you are not a threat. I have to keep in my mind, where are my hands at all times? What am I doing? I don't want to move too fast. I don't want to move too slow. I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to, I don't want to say the right thing in the wrong way. See, that is what the white privilege is that you don't have to think about all that stuff. Because it's a, it's a willful ignorance. And I say willful simply because when you know that there's this issue, you got to just open your eyes. That's what we're talking about, being woke. When, when our young people say, you got to be woke, that means you can't, just, you can't go through life pretending that what you see, what, what, what's happening around you is a dream that is not reality. But let me, let me finish this up, brothers and sisters. 
Not only, so, so that, was, that was principle number one. God sees and God knows the willful ignorance and wanton insecurity of the oppressor. But in verses 15, 16, and 17, it says that the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shephra and the other named Pua. And when he said this, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women, and when you see them on the birth stool, when you see them about to give birth, watch this. He says, if it is a son, <laughs> if it is a male, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. If it's a son, kill him. If it's a daughter, let her live. I want you to know this has always been the formula for maintaining oppression by the oppressor over the oppressed. Don't let the boys become me. <laughs> Dr. Jawanja Kanjufu said it's the conspiracy to destroy black boys. Because if you kill the boys, then that means that the leadership of this culture won't ever rise up. But like I can tell you right now, you can kill in a whole lot of ways. It's not just physical death. If you make sure that they go to jail and not, and not, to, not to college, then, then it's the same thing. If you make sure that they cannot provide for their family so they, they find their, 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 their way into a life of, of drugs and, 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 and selling just to get by, then, and I know you say everybody does have a choice, but when the deck is stacked against you intentionally, what I'm saying is it's the same thing that Pharaoh was doing here. He said to the, watch this, to the Hebrew women, he said, I want you, I want your own people to help us to destroy your little boys. But the midwives, watch this in verse number 17, the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the male children live. Principle number two, brothers and sisters, God sees and God knows the faithfulness of the oppressed who fear him who fear God and do not fear their oppressors. I want y'all to understand this. This simply means that we've got to do like the midwives did, and we've got to know what is the will of God, and we know, got to have to know how to speak truth to power while we're in obedience to God. That means that we can't simply do what everybody else is doing, but what we have to do is make sure that we focus our response in a way that glorifies God. We've got to be able to stand up flat-footed, and firm and declare that we will not tolerate, we will not accept, we will not own, we will not allow for our people, for our, bro our, our, our sons, our men, our daughters to be cast out, to be beaten down. And I know that I might get beat down just for saying this, but I'm standing on the promise of God that he's going to protect me, that he's going to keep me. And just like the three Hebrew boys said, even even if, oh king, even if God allows me to leave this place to be burned up in the fire, he's still God. And I believe he's going to use that to liberate his people. And don't get it twisted. This isn't, this isn't liberation theology because the, the reality of it is not, not, not black liberation theology, theology. I'm not simply preaching this to say that, that as black people we should be free. I'm saying that the Bible says that all of us should be free no matter what color you are. That God hates when one person, one another on this earth and God is always going to take care of the oppressed. But then, brothers and sisters... See, I won't spend much time there because I believe you understand where we are. Verse 22, finally, of my third principle here. Verse 22 says, Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, because the little trick with the midwives didn't work. He commanded all of his people, saying, watch this, Every son 
that is born to the Hebrews because the response of the midwives was this. If you haven't read the, 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 this, the story, and I use story to mean the, the details of this historical and factual event, it says the midwife, when the king said, what is happening? Why, Why aren't you doing what I told you to do? And even though they let the, the male children live, what they said is they, they told the truth. And that's why I said we got to speak truth to power because it came from God. And the Bible says because they did this, God treated them well. God, God blessed them with families. And, and, and what their response was, they said, when we go into the Hebrew women, see, they said the Hebrew women aren't like y'all Egyptian women. See, y'all, y'all are soft. The, the Egyptian women are soft, but the Hebrew women are strong women. Don't that sound like some women that y'all know that's been through something? Amen. He said, and they, when they go to their birthing stools, before we get there, they've already delivered the babies because their bodies are in tip-top shape and they didn't need us. They, they took care of themselves. And by the time we got there, they've already delivered. And the Bible says because that, they gave that response. Then verse 22, Pharaoh commanded all his people. And he said, every son that is born to the Hebrews, he says, now I want you to think about this. He's giving license to the masses, he says, every male, every son, male child, son, that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Doesn't that sound familiar that there's been an indirect authorization to see Brother Arbery running and to chase after him and gun him down in the name of justice. Y'all miss that. The king, the pharaoh is saying, I'm not just giving the order from my throne. I'm telling, it's not just my, my soldiers and my men that's carrying out this order. I want all of the people that believe in me, that's with me, that, that, that follow after me, to handle this situation for us. The Hebrew midwives would not do the deed, so I want the, I want the citizens, I'm deputizing you to get out there and get those male Hebrew babies and throw them into the Nile. This is principle number three. Y'all, y'all, <laughs> y'all look shot. Y'all, y'all don't understand. God, this ain't nothing new under the sun. God sees and God knows those who promote, that is the king, and those who participate. Those are the people that listen to the orders of the king, those who promote and those who participate in the oppression of others. We must realize that because of the systemic and the systematic nature of this oppression, it can come from anywhere and it can come from anyone and when you least expect it. All I'm saying to you, brothers and sisters, that you got to keep your eyes open. You got to stay woke because the king, Pharaoh, has authorized the masses to take the male Hebrew babies and throw them into the Nile. I'm going to leave that alone. Let me just give you the personal practice in progress because this comes when we return to verses 23 through 25. God allowed the children of Israel to have to deal with this issue for a long, long time. But God never failed to see them. God never failed to know their plight and their condition. And so during those many days, many days, many days, the king of Egypt died. That simply means that as bad as it looked, this won't last always. And the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery, because of their oppression, and they cried out for help. And their cry for rescue from this oppression, from slavery, it went up to God, the Bible says. And verse 24 says, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant, 
with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel. God knew, God cared, God understood, and God answered us. Here's, here's our personal progress and practice. We've got to not just cognitively know, we've got to know in our hearts and in our spirits that God will deliver us. You've got to keep lifting your voice and trusting in God. Because there has never, that was my practice and my progress. God will deliver us. Thank you. You got to just keep lifting your voice and keep trusting in God. Because there has never been one single time when the oppressed liberated and delivered themselves from oppression. You may not believe that because the history books won't always show you what the reality behind the surface, but it has always been the hand of God. God raised up and called Moses to deliver his people. God is the one who sent Moses to Pharaoh. It was God who opened up the Red Sea. It was God who closed it back up and drowned all of Pharaoh's army. Justice is birthed out of righteousness. If there is no righteousness, there can be no justice. The only way, the only way that people of color, that black and brown people, people of ebony hue are going to be justified uh, by the system uh, is for righteousness to run down, uh, for righteousness to rain down, uh, for righteousness to impede uh, and invade uh, and pervade the hearts of men. Uh, have I got a witness in here?